Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we've had the privilege of, of gathering these amazing uh, uh, panelists today, and uh, we want to talk about... Um, I started the wrong paragraph. <laughs> uh, let me start that again. Uh, we've... Uh, <laughs> We've had the privilege of speaking to exhibitors and artists by coming to all these conventions. Um, and over and over again, we hear from everybody that uh, the grind is hard as an artist and a creator, and uh, especially on, this, on social media right now. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but it's a shit show. Uh, and being an artist on social media or a creator in general is, is pretty much like an uphill battle, and it's gotten worse in the recent years, especially with COVID kind of like ramping everything up, uh, and you know, the horrors of the world also ramping everything up. And it just kind of feels like we're stuck in the algorithm, the, the, the eye of Sauron, if you will, and uh, trying to get out of that or, or trying to figure out a way to use it as a tool instead of it using us. Uh, and that is what I'm angry about all the time. I don't know about everybody else. Same with you, right? You're angry. No, I'm totally fine. He's angry <laughs> in his life. Um, so we got together this fantastic panel of awesome people, and we're going to try our best to solve this whole problem today, uh, here in the next 40 minutes. So uh, buckle up, because it's time for questions. At oh, the end. yeah, you can ask yeah. some questions at the end. Yeah. So we're going to introduce the panelists today. Um, so first up, she is a New York Times best-selling author. A former host of the Musical Splitting Podcast. Yes, yeah. we, we used to hold host a podcast together. It was about musicals, comma, are they good? <laughs> also a huge fan of Fanta the Opera, please welcome Lindsay Ellis. Thank you. Uh, and next to Lindsay here we have Daisy Noemi. She is uh, a film photographer, cat lover, mm -hmm. and she also has a, as an organizer of the LA Zine Fest for the last 11 years. Next up, he is an oat cappuccino addict <laughs> and local San Diego illustrator and educator. Please welcome Patrick Ballesteros. And over here at the end, we have Holden McNeely, and he is a uh, co host of Wizard and the Bruiser and Page Seven Podcasts and a partnered Twitch streamer. Professional hype man. Yeah. Uh, so before we get into the bitching and moaning part of this, we figured we'd start off talking about what the good old days were, what these platforms used to be for us, and what they used to do, and how they helped us. So let's start with you, Lindsay. Uh, how did it first help you out? Why don't you take us through what the journey was in terms of being positive? Well, I think this is true of every single person who is like remotely influencer adjacent. And the reality is they just got lucky. Like they uh, kind of, you would start with a template of some sort and eventually the algorithm would favor you. And if it didn't, then you're just never going to make it on whatever the platform happens to be. And usually you can see your uh, audience into other platforms like you know currently my main one is Instagram and I really don't like Instagram but like it's kind of the least of all evils presently because uh, it's the I mean, we can, we can get into the, the nuts and bolts of how each individual platform uh, w was built for, you know, audience benefit, benefit when it was in its explosive growth phase, but most of them are past that and they have like pivoted to profitability, which is a big problem. But it's, it's kind of hard to say. We're really like, because I, uh, I, I started my, like I was kind of hopping from channel to channel and platform to platform for many years and then in 2018, YouTube changed its algorithm to favor watch time over views. And that benefited me, and that's how I got lucky, was I had really long form videos, and suddenly, like, within a year or two, I had a million subscribers, um, purely because YouTube changed its algorithm. Um, and so that, it, you know, and YouTube is still more or less the same, others less so, yeah. but um, yeah, it really is just kind of a luck game as much as it is a strategy game. But initially, for maybe the few people who don't know 
where you started. Mm -hmm. You were on YouTube a long, long no, time. No, no, I started on, I, it's a now defunct website called blip.tv. Oh, I've never even heard of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, that, I started there in 2008, and I, that was my main gig until about 2014. Okay. And then uh, I was on a, uh, I, 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 then blip got met, bought by Maker, which okay. uh, got bought by Disney the next day because they had a s pretty illegal gentleman's agreement that because Ma okay Maker Disney. Studios was a uh, well okay it, it, what is it called MCN uh, they don't MCNs aren't really a thing anymore but like the, it was a it was an, it was a network that and Disney wanted to buy them but they wanted them to have their own platform and long story short that's why Blip doesn't exist anymore I then got shunted onto Blip's YouTube channel which was called Wait for it. The League of Super Critics. <laughs> the, yeah, it just like, you know, put, and they, they, we had t-shirts, they were good t-shirts. Um, and then I was on that for a while, and then I eventually started focusing on my own in 2017. Okay. So yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 those, and the funny thing about Blip is it was not algorithm uh, based, and, and that was to my benefit at that time, because mm -hmm. that was in the long, long ago time, back when things were built up organically. Yeah. Uh, Daisy? Um, for LA Zine Fest, I feel like we didn't really use social media that much before. Um, we relied heavily on word of mouth and like flyering. Um, since social media is really popular, it's like prevalent, we all use it. We rely heavily on social media to get the word out for our Zine Fest. Um, and then flyering it has become difficult because the coffee shops don't necessarily allow you to flyer anymore. Um, there are only some that allow it, and now they're like, no, we don't want anything. And like our flyers that we leave in the stores are literally like four by six, five by seven. We can't leave anything anywhere. So we rely heavily on social media. What we do use in that way is we just tell our friends to just reshare our, our stuff, and that's how we navigate using that tool to get the word out for LA Zine Fest now. Patrick, you're a bit of an old buck like us. You remember the old, old internet? Yes, typewriters and all. And all. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so I'm going to date myself. Not date myself, that sounds weird. I know. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. You're going to woo yourself. Yeah, I'm going to woo myself. It's so good. Uh, so started with more forums, right? Like art forums, that's for me since I'm a visual artist, illustrator. And that's where you would connect with people like, oh, they did the speed painting, oh, like what brushes are you using, things like that. So there wasn't any, I think Facebook was maybe just started, it might have been just in MySpace or Friendster. That's, yeah. Anyone knows that? Right. Good old days. I, 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 yes, yeah. yes, my people. Okay. Uh, top so eight. it started there, yeah. Top, top eight, my top eight. And Tom, Tom's always Tom. your friend. Tom's your friend. Uh, so we started there, and that's, that's how you connected with those people. And so you would get to know those names and see that, oh, yeah, your, work's, your work looks great. Oh, that's looking awesome. Oh, you're kicking butt there. So it went from that, and then you started more specific with Blogger, right? You would start mm -hmm. your blog and your journal, blogging your images a day, waiting for someone to comment. Yeah. Like, oh, there's three comments. Hold on, who was that? Okay, no, that's an uh, <laughs> ad for something. Shit, shoot. Um, but then you would start to form relationships that way, and that's how I met some artists. I would actually go on their site, go on their blogger, and put a comment. And then the thing was, I would wait until like a, a convention or a portfolio review or somewhere where I would meet that artist and go, hey, not in a creepy way, but I commented on your stuff. I just want to say hi in person. And that's how you would start that rapport, right? Just doing that. Okay, fast forward, now we're into like Instagram and all that stuff. When Instagram first started, my, my photographer friend introduced it to me because it was mainly for photographers and things like that. And so he showed me how it worked, my first profile, my first image was my, uh, he took a picture, I'm like, oh, this is cool, okay, cool, we're just putting pictures, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so at the beginning, it was great because that then exposed you to a wider audience, a wider reach, not just other artists, but now other people that appreciate art, other people that are looking to dabble in art, other people that are learning you know, different things. And that's when it was very organic in the way that you would get a lot of things uh, in your search page that like relate to you, but then you would pop up in way more other people's pages and it would definitely populate and you would get a lot more followers and you, you would be able to communicate, connect with a larger percentage. Now it's like 0.1% of 0.1% that I reach. But that's kind of how it was for me earlier, and that's kind of the lineage of how it grew. And Holden, how about you? What was it like for you way back in the day? So, uh, 
<laughs> I think that's Sorry, Hall what? H below us. By oh, the way. are we are we above Hall H? Yeah. Okay, I was like, I should like I be worried? Kind of like a butt massage so, over here. So speaking of YouTube, I, I watch a lot of disaster YouTube and a lot of <laughs> a lot of engineering failure YouTube, and a lot of it starts like this. <laughs> Live in fear. So. So for me, it was kind of interesting. We, I had this like tunnel vision. I got together with this sketch comedy group in college. We were called Murder Fist. We moved to New York City. We, we were just trying to, we, we were just like, this is how you get a TV show. You have the hottest show in New York City. You know, I read all about this, Kids in the Hall and you know, all these different groups, Mr. Show. You get the hottest live show in the city. The business people come to you. They go, I'll give you a show. And I was like, we're gonna, get, we're gonna be the next Mr. Show. We're gonna get a show on HBO. It's gonna go that way. The second we got to New York, we got the hottest show in New York, and then like New York Times, like blah, 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 all that stuff, right? And like people are showing up, and then all of a sudden it was like, you need to have a million people viewing your YouTube like sketch video. Like it was the era of like workaholics, Broad City. And if we all remember the uh, great web series epidemic of, that, of the <laughs> early 2010s, everybody had a web series, including myself and all of my friends. Yeah. And there was Funny or Die, and there was yeah. uh, My Damn Channel, and there was all these comedy websites. And all of a sudden it was about like making something viral and the how do we do that? And we were like, the fuck we all we were just gonna do the hottest show in New York and then the managers come and then and so then our friend Marcus was over on the on one side making these podcasts doing this new podcasting thing and uh, you know with really great thing here we were one of the first groups of assholes in a basement making really like off-color jokes. Uh, and we did that for many years for free, week in, week out. Uh, then um, a few of those people went off and did uh, Last Podcast on the Left. That blew up, that kind of helped us kind of elevate. Um, but at the same time, I was like getting that niche fan base to just that smaller group of people to, to support me and what I'm trying to do. And that's how we made it work. Thank you. Um, at, at what point would you say this all kind of started to, to go downhill for you? Like, a, like a, I, think, I think Holden just summed it up well, that, you, that kind of 2012 era of like, okay, everyone it has to be online at all times. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, then you're irrelevant. So like, did you ever feel like any that, that happened to you, Lindsay, where you, where you, um, you were on a social media app and then suddenly you started to being like, I have to, I have to keep up with this constantly or I'm going to fall behind. That's how I feel about Instagram, honestly. Right. Cause I, like a, 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 when did you start noticing that? Um, well, I think Twitter, it was when a certain someone decided they wanted to buy it. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, that didn't apply to me personally, but like just, just seeing the way Twitter works now is like, if you want attention on Twitter, you have to pay. Right, um, but I think it, it depends on what you, what like what what you're actually selling. Like, what is your where? You know, it's a lot easier to get people to engage with a podcast or a YouTube series than like a book or a any kind of like art or some some physical thing that you're asking people to buy. And you know, especially right now, they really punish any kind of like advertising for that sort of thing. Like, because I was just looking at my Instagram, like trying to remember where this was. And um, like each e each of my last posts has fewer likes than the last because it was all like promotional stuff. So I have to like jam pictures of my babies in there, and it's very cynical, but it works. You know, it's like you have to put stuff in there that you know people are going to engage with, so then they actually see the stuff that you want them to see. I don't want pictures of my children out there, but so they got to they got to pay for the college somehow. Can you imagine how? Can you imagine how expensive that's going to be in 20 years? And I have two girls, white women. They're going to have to pay. They're going to have to pay full price. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, that happened for you as well, right? You've got a decent Instagram thing going on that somehow, so suddenly doesn't show to anybody. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to, should I, can I go? I'm going to go off about this. Uh, <laughs> so I would say that with me, I first went viral in 2011. I was making fun of hipsters on my blog, drawing hipsters, you know, making fun of them because I was one. And it went viral on StumbleUpon. Do you guys remember StumbleUpon? Yeah. 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 
but it was weirdly went viral under the, the, uh, the category of marine biology for some reason. Um, and so I had a bunch of marine biologists, core marine biologist followers of those, those first few years. And I was on Blogger, and I, I went viral, and I was like, this is great. The day I went viral, I was like, I'm set. I don't have to do anything else. <laughs> this is how the internet works. And I immediately realized that that means nothing. Um, and so as long as you, you, I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna get the, my, my core followers. And then I got a job at BuzzFeed because I decided to draw every single day for a year, or for two years straight, and um, do a four panel comic every day. And BuzzFeed saw me, BuzzFeed Comics, they picked me up, and that's when I started to get Instagram traction. This was around 2016, and I had been kind of putting in the work for about two years, and and it was great. It was awesome. Like, I was getting great feedback, and it was during, the, as Lindsay said, the growth period of, of um, these apps where they're like, everyone get on here. And artists help build a lot of those apps with their, you know, everything. As, and we signed it all away to them, of course. Not, you know, what, what, that's what they want. Um, and so, around 2021, I don't know if you guys have noticed that too, around 2021, 2022, suddenly everything just dropped. And I was no longer able to sell things online. I was no longer getting engagement. And it made me deeply angry um, because I knew that it was church switching into that like profit uh, phase where you have to pay for all of it. You have to pay to be seen. And so um, that is like the present problem, I think, is it's just bloated, built on artist communities, and the accounts now, uh, the algorithms now ignore all of those accounts. And we're here floundering. Uh, I mean, I, would, you, would you agree with that, um, Patrick, for you too? Like, I know that you do a newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, is that uh, did, when did you start realizing that's where you wanted to where you wanted to take this? So the reason I gave you that big story is because it's almost like I'm going backwards, going back to like the forums, going back to like the blogger in a sense. Uh, with the newsletter, I know I can connect with my audience. Now it is a 50% open rate, but I'm reaching way more than even on the Instagram, right? On the Instagram, it's like the, the villain. Um, <laughs> And why I use the, the newsletter is that it creates a little bit more of that core engagement with your audience. So then the question is, but yeah, I don't have an audience right now. Who am I gonna send my newsletter to? The thing you have to realize now, it's, it's harder more than ever to build that community, but once you build that community, it's your community. It's part of yours. You don't have to worry about that algorithm or anything taking it away from you, no. Now with that great power comes great responsibility in that you need to give value to who's on that newsletter, and you don't want to take advantage of them by always having an ask, asking, oh, buy this, asking, oh, we could look at this, or go here. You put that in there, but you need to find something unique to you that you can express, like a story of how you made something, or, you know, I found this on the net and I thought you guys would enjoy it too. And you have to put that spin on it so that it's like, oh wow, that newsletter wasn't just about pretty pictures or selling stuff, there's actually a story there, there's actually something well crafted. Yeah, that takes time, but would you rather take time doing that or making a video that's trending that you really feel yucky doing, but you're doing it anyway? Because I found myself doing those every once in a while and I'm like, I really hate those. I just want to make art, I want to make cool stuff, I don't want to sit here trying to make a video that's not me, so. And you want to get it into the, the in front of the people you want to see it. And that's what, it's not happening anymore. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I can't like, because I just had a book come out in June, and I remember the day it came out, um, Jason Pargan, uh, the author of uh, John Dies at the End in the Zoe Ash series, like, he's a friend, he and I have the same editor, and he posted about my book, and I, like, half the replies were like, oh, I had no idea, and I'm just like, my God, you know? Like, how, I, uh, like, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. Like, if, if there's just no way to even get it in front of the people who are interested, you know? And, uh, you know, I think, I think that's sort of the problem here is a lot of us, like me in particular, have kind of like built our careers off of the back of this algorithm that, that is basically like people will only, they only want to see certain things. Because yeah. um, I, I also released a video on my YouTube channel, which I, you know, do once in an extremely blue moon. And, uh, uh, it, you know, it got like 100,000 views, which is, you know, respectable for something that exists only to sell something, but I lost like 2,000 subs, you know, because it was just, people were like, oh, okay, this is just what you do now. And so I very cynically re-uploaded a video that I made for Nebula, uh, which is another streaming platform, which is another, like, its own thing where they, uh, you know, their whole thing is, we have no algorithm. We are curated and creator-owned and duh. Don't, don't, don't tell them I talked about them like that. <laughs> I respect them deeply. Um, this is Going yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and uh, like then that that video did really well, and then I got twenty thousand subs back, and it's just kind of like, 
you know, and, it, and it's, it's like, fine, you know, I worked really hard on it, but it's just, you know, there's this question, right, of like, how, how do you actually get things in front of people who are interested in them to get around the people who aren't? And like, the vast majority of people are not. Yeah. I think the solution is to not do it there. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, One thing so, I was going to oh, say yeah, real quick, uh, uh, yeah, I feel like I, I said my first roadblock was initially when I got to New York and it was like, YouTube videos must go viral and this whole idea of comedy and virility and all this kind of stuff and like literally like talking to like awful people in meeting rooms trying to be like the science of viral, like how do we all come together and make something go viral, you know, we're just like, I, dude, I don't know. And I like what you said, uh, Patrick, about like, you know, that's kind of what Twitch was for me with like, you were talking about with the zine or um, which is just they can I have my smaller audience and they can give just directly to me and support me directly with donations and subs and stuff which is cool but then the breakdown on that is like other people are weirded out by twitch or don't get twitch and you know and then there's this weirdness and now YouTube's trying to like get into the twitch space and then the messaging gets really difficult so I know I've kind of cut my audience down from what it could be, but uh, it's like the give and take of like, versus just, but you guys can just support me and you just know where to find me and I don't have to like play that. I can't do it because the newest alienation has been TikTok. I like don't get it. Oh I don't get TikTok. I like don't, I don't get, get it, how to yeah. do it. And I've, I just love all these murmurs of like, yeah. 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 <laughs> Like, I, 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 I went to my For You page for the first time, like, basically ever, when, uh, you know, a certain news story happened on Sunday of last week, uh, and just, just to kind of check the vibe, and it was not long until I got ferreted right into right-wing TikTok, and, oh, yeah. like, you know, people talked about, like, they can't even define what a woman is, and I'm like, oh my, my God. God. So, yeah, I, I do not understand the appeal of TikTok. I don't understand how you make it on TikTok, so I gave up. But I, I have a, an uh, ex-girlfriend of mine who's really talented, was in a, other, a different sketch comedy group. She figured it out. She started doing these like two camera characters and it it totally like got her a stand-up tour and like got her hundreds of thousands. I'm like, what is, and I'm looking at it, I'm just like, you're great, I'm, I'm not, I'm, but I'm deeply jealous of like, you know, I'm not like resentful because she's like a good person and deserves it, but I'm just like, how did you do, like, what is that? How did you figure that out? And I try to do it and I just feel like an idiot and I look yeah. like an idiot, so. <laughs> well, one other thing that is relevant to, I think everybody here is if you want to be traditionally published in anything, um, and it used to be like icing on the cake for you to have a platform, a social media platform. Now it is baseline. It is mandatory. And like, because pe pe people thought I got a book deal real easy. Like, no, I had I had to like scrape and fight for like what what, what measly little one I did get. Uh, and it's like almost ten years too. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, yeah. and it and it and it's just they. That's what they expect expect to be the baseline now. Like in my case, it was like, okay, cool. You have a, a, a an audience. That's cute. Uh, can do you have a product we can sell? Um, and you know, I guess that 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 is good. But it's also just like the author has to do the vast majority of their marketing now, unless you are like a seven-figure extreme outlier spiders gay org who should not be counted. You know, like they, they used to, like maybe one percent of people get like enough promotion from their publisher to like m not need to pr self-promote. Like that is just the expectation now. It's the baseline. It's not fair because, like, I spent the entire first half of this year basically doing a, a job I'm not getting paid for, you know, which is marketing. And it's exhausting. And you're trying to, like, constantly, like, outsmart social media and figure it out. And, like, but that is just the way it is now. I firmly believe that um, community matters, obviously, where people were a, a, communal, a communal creature. Uh, and what I really admire about uh, what Daisy does, which is organize LA Zine Fest, is that you get the art into people's hands in person in a local setting where you can support each other and you can learn from each other. And I think that is actually one of the, needs to be one of the foundational foundations to moving forward. And so I just wanted to a ask you, Daisy, like what made you want to start building the local community and like um, helping people access art? 
Um, I think, you know, I lived in San Diego for a long time, uh, for 10 years, and I think I was having maybe like an identity crisis like in my uh, late 20s. Um, and so then I got introduced to zines, and then I started making zines, and I started going to uh, zine events and zine, uh, you know, just finding people within the zine community. And then I finally moved back to Los Angeles, um, and I came back right when they were starting the first LA Zine Fest in 2011. So I got to meet the co-creators of um, the creators of, Z of LA Zine Fest, and I just fell in love with like finding people that were like-minded. I mean, the beauty of zines is they can literally be about anything, like anything niche, abstract, weird, uh, basic. It could be DIY, like how to do X, Y, Z. Um, it just, it's really great, and I, I think with the pandemic uh, especially happening, everybody felt really isolated, and it was one way to stay in contact and in community with each other. Um, and because the algorithm is terrible, you know, it really helps the creators stay inspired in a way because you get to meet people that fall in love with your work and you get to meet other artists that, you know, maybe um, inspire you in their own way or potentially like just building connection is really all that it's about. And I feel like the pandemic really propelled that desire to stay connected with each other one-to-one um, -one in person. Um, but I really love it. I really love providing a space for people to just meet each other and, you know, LA Zine Fest gets really beautiful emails at the end of it, being like, oh, we, I really needed this. I've been having a rough year. Or like, oh, I, I almost gave up on my art, but I, you know, I met some really beautiful, cool people, and I really love being a part of that. Yeah. Can you talk a little about the process of how you decide on how many people to let in? Because I know it, when I went a couple of weeks ago, it was yeah. like people hanging from the rafters. It was so packed. It was so impressive. It felt almost like half a day here in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it was off the beaten path too, which was what was really crazy about it. Yeah, so like again, we just rely heavily on word of mouth and social media to get the word out. And when we open our applications, it's always kind of like a scary feeling because we don't really ever know how many people will apply. Um, this For this year, we got 500 applications, which is a lot. We are a small team. There were five of us this year that had to go through each application and curate. Um, so I guess we're the algorithm, so to speak, because we're looking through each application to see, but we always prioritize people of color, um, queer, trans uh, identities. Um, we prioritize women as well. Um, so we always find, uh, I, I'm not going to say the best, but stuff that's like, if we get 100 comic creators in our batches, we have to find the most different or interesting, but it's just like so, it's just so hard. It's a really hard, it's a really difficult process. We have to look through the applications over and over and over and over to, to cool down, to cool down our, our options because for the 500 applicants that we got, we were only able to accept about 140. So that's like, we get so many people that are mad at us and um, about it and they, they send us nasty emails and DMs and that's cool, but I get it. For some people it really means a lot to be a part of it and sometimes we just don't have the space. Yeah. Um, but it's really, really difficult and we try our best to include as many people as we can. Um, and we try to create a diverse, uh, you know, option or, you know, for every for exhibitor list for everybody. So we do try to include all kinds of creators, all kinds, all kinds of genres, and I don't know, there's just so much that goes into it. Yeah, like, yeah. it's pretty intense. Is it worth it? <laughs> I think so. Yes, I love it. I love community organizing. I love being able to provide a space for people that aren't necessarily always prioritized in mainstream media. Um, I think that's really important because our narratives exist, you know, whether or not they're seen on TV, public radio, like whatever, like we exist, people of color, you know, on our own, obviously without all of that. And there are issues that we deal with that should be, you know, made uh, known because it's different for people of color. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, can you speak a little bit about that as well in terms of how you engage with people offline, because you seem to be a pretty, I don't know if you guys know, but he's a little bit popular <laughs> here in San Diego. But uh, if you can talk a little bit how you translate that from the digital space to the physical space. Uh, so I'm fortunate that I do have quite a few people you know, visiting me each year, but that was not overnight. And so I think that's the one thing that a lot of people do need to realize is there is a little bit of that grind in building your community and building that thing. Um, 
And so for me, it's consistency. I can't control if I get in or don't get into Comic-Con, but if I do get in, my mentality is, if this is my last show, I'm coming in and bringing the heat. And that's the way I do it. And so bringing the heat, not necessarily just in regards to what I make and what I'm gonna sell, but in also the experience that I'm going to give the people that are waiting in line and how I converse and talk to them. And I think that's a big part of it. As an artist and creator, we're all introverts. But if you want to be very successful uh, at this, one, being good with marketing, that's something I hate doing, but I have to do that. Two, is being able to somehow connect with your audience member so that they feel like you really gave me time, you really connected with me, even if it's just for a second, even if it was just a hand on the shoulder, like, hey, how are you doing? Or, oh, what were you looking at? Or what are you interested in? Or like, what do you do for a living? For me, I don't like to talk about my art that much. I like to talk to the person, ask them like, where are you coming from? Or what is it that you do for a living? That's my big question is what do you do for a living? And you get the wildest answers. <laughs> like, oh, I'm a uh, pediatrician, uh, neurologist and stuff I'm like, whoa, crazy. And so that starts the conversation in a more natural way. And by doing that, like I've I, taken down their guard and now we're just like people to pe you know, person to person, and it connects me more to them. So that the next year they come back like, oh, uh, last year I was pregnant. Now this is my kid, and you know we have your artwork in the room. And I'm like, damn, that hits hard. And that's the stuff that makes me smile, and that's what keeps me going to make art. It helps me to make a living, but it also helps me to like satisfy that art soul that, that wants to create and why I'm doing it. I was going to ask Holden really quick. Um, you have, uh, I have noticed through your streaming and, and, and uh, over the years I've been following you for a while and you have had managed to kind of carve this niche community and uh, a really supportive one that shows up for you. And, and how has it, has it been, um, hold on. How do you do that? How do you, how, how? <laughs> <laughs> Can you help me? Um. <laughs> I think I just posted on Facebook. I was just like, what's up all my Holdenators? That's the name of my fans. <laughs> As a joke. And then I just started writing the joke, just the Holdenators ho thing and all that. And, uh, you know, it just, but it started to, and actually one of the other things I started doing on the podcast was be, I was um, I was getting really back into video games really hardcore, but I had no one to play with or talk about video games with. So I just started coming in and being like, These, here's your PlayStation Network shout outs. And it was just people DMing me on PlayStation Network. <laughs> and I would read the messages off in the show, literally just so I could try to find somebody to like play a video game with. <laughs> and it just sort of naturally created this community that I didn't really uh, fully observe until I started like streaming on Twitch and it was like 20 people at first, you know, 20, 30 people. Uh, and I think uh, the real game changer was I was uh, doing Lexi Loves Game Night with my wife, uh, Lexi, and we were playing through all of Final Fantasy VII, which is my favorite game from my childhood. I was having her play it for the first time. And we kept complaining about our couch. And we were just like, we have this shitty couch. We wish we had a better couch. And people were like, dude, drop a PayPal link. We'll help pay for your a new couch. And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, put a pay we've been watching you every week for hours. Like, I'll give you 10 bucks for a couch. And we raised money for the couch in like nice. a couple weeks. And we were like, wait a second. And then my awful day job that I had gave me an ultimatum. They were like, you're out of here by March or you're gonna have to like triple down your responsibilities. And I'm like, I'm not gonna be real estate insurance for a career, so that's insane. So I was like, what if I raise up money for a gaming PC and just go full time on Twitch and you know, I already had the podcast going and stuff like that. And I got it in like a couple, uh, like a month, I raised up enough money for a gaming PC and I quit my job and I mean, I, you know, I've talked about it before. I did a whole Twitch episode of my podcast, Was the Bruiser, where I get really emotional talking about it. But I mean, there were just total strangers online being like, I believe in you, man. Here's like $300 for your gaming PC. And it was, it blew me away. It was really like, uh, I couldn't believe it, you know, and it just kind of went from there. But literally started as a joke. And I think it was also, I just took a lot of wild swings because I had friends succeeding and the groups I was a part of, like, section, you know, were falling apart because people were like just exploding in their own ways. And the other thing I did was I was just like, last podcast the left is exploding. I'm so jealous. I, I, I'm so upset I'm not where they are at. And then I was like, why don't I do edutainment? Why don't I do what they're doing? Why don't I just do what my friends are doing? And then they gave me all the resources for it and stuff. So, and then speaking of like meeting people in person, 
you know, their touring agency is William Morris. And they were like, we'll put a tour together for you guys. So we just got this cool in on a tour agent just because we were you know, aligned with them. So I think the big lesson there is just like, suck up the jealousy and align yourself with these people, you know? Uh, do all things through spite. Yeah. Yeah, and anger. try to beat them or join them. Join them or one. beat them. Either one, it's okay to be fueled by negativity. <laughs> I'm only half joking. Um, I wanted to say, to, to, I wanted to have some time for questions, so I wanted to start wrapping this up, but um, well, I wanted to end on a positive note. The old internet is absolutely dead, because... Yay. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> rest uh, in, rest in rest power, in, live journal. I was, <laughs> I was going to say rest in, in pieces, but yeah, let's go... For, going forward, I, I, I want to... I feel a lot of hope about... Um, what we're going to, how we're going to build community as 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 creators going forward, using tools like Patreon, uh, automated stuff like Discord, in-person events, classes, uh, zine fests, craft fairs, and making these personal networks and things um, accessible for the next generation who is coming up to this insane world where you can barely get seen. We'll ensure that we don't lose that community. We can have that 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 connection from one generation to the next to help them step up and to to um, feel confident putting their creation into the world, and we're not saying tech is evil <laughs> or bad, um, it's just uh, it can be harnessed and used in a way that benefits you instead of you being used by it, or you being um, kind of controlled by it by trends and having to pay and stuff like that, and I, I wanted to say, through my, through my experience, followers truly, the amount of followers truly don't matter. It's fine at first. But what matters is that core group of people and getting to see them in person, and get, or not even in person, because you might be in the middle of nowhere, but having those tight-knit communities where you, you help each other out. Like, I was really quick, if we can, he does this thing on our Discord where he, he has this ability to kind of just like make people like creative. Um, and uh, he, he, was, he did this, uh, what was it? Uh, the prompt, he did a drawing prompt. He got, on the, he got on our Discord, he's like, okay, we're gonna draw this today. And people who've never drawn in their life were like, all right. And now we have all these inside jokes and characters, and it was it was one of the most wholesome uh, things. And I, did you want to add anything to that, or can I just talk about you? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> anyway, we, we want to create a space where other artists and young people feel able to participate. And uh, please. Yeah, I, I think also just briefly, like we talked a lot about this stuff about the old days, but. You know, I think that's where a lot of this is going back to. It's sort of bounced back and retracted, but we now have different tools like we didn't use to. So I know a lot of people had raised their hands that they're starting small businesses or they're thinking of going into this space. And now you can go get like, you know, some cool t-shirt design that you made can get printed and sent to your house or you can get pins or whatever. It's so much more accessible than it was, let's say 20 years ago where you had to ship something overseas. So we're sort of in this weird place where it's almost like the best of both worlds, where as long as we move forward with a, you know, a positive idea in our hearts, we can have the resources to be able to execute those. And uh, lastly, I know we covered a lot of stuff, but if anybody here, before we finish up, you guys want to kind of give like a couple of bullet points of maybe you're not like trying to start the biggest thing ever, but maybe three things that you each think is like really useful for someone to walk away with. Um, networking is important, sorry. Um, like, I, and, and in-person networking too. Like, that's part of why I, like, I pushed so hard to get a tour for my book, because my first two came out during the pandemic, and I, because I think it is extremely important to, like, you know, meet people and make contact with people and sh engage with your audience and, you know, be kind to them um, so that they will stick around. Um, but, like, also professional networking. Like, by, I, I was randomly a guest of honor at this con in 2018, and I met another author there who had no idea who I was and had no idea who she was. And she, ab about two years later, was a co-author of This Is How You Lose the Time War. And she got me nominated for my first Hugo for marketing. Or just just by advocating for me, and this was just a chance meeting at a con because I was at a TGI Fridays, and that was the only place that had veggie burgers, you know. <laughs> so not he never, the Olive Garden. He, yeah, not, <laughs> there was no Olive Garden next to that hotel. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just uh, you, it, you try to engage as much in person as possible because you never know who you might meet and what. And then this per, she's a dear friend of mine to this day. She blurred for my last book, so you never know. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just going to add two things to that. I think um, it's important to just keep putting your your work out there, and or maybe three. I think also when you're a beginning uh, creator. It's hard to maybe find your voice within whatever medium you're trying to express yourself, but I feel like it's kind of always changing depending on the experiences that you have and the, maybe the influences that you um, get exposed to throughout your creative journey. Um, so I think that always strive to be your best, but also like don't be afraid of change. Um, and then maybe the second thing that I would add is just uh, just not be afraid to, I guess, to, to kind of like intersect with that statement is that not be afraid to just be yourself because there was someone out there or maybe many maybe thousands of or millions of people that probably think your stuff is really really rad you just haven't found them yet and i think if you continue to do that you will come across those people at some point in your journey uh, from from an artist's point of view how i learn how we get better is drawing from masters right you learn you see how they do it you see the process down below in all of Khan, there's masters of marketing, there's masters of production, there's masters of creating the QR codes and all that stuff. So go down. If there's something that you're interested in, like how do they collect emails or how are they doing this? How are they catching my eye? What are they doing here? Go there. Take pictures. Maybe talk to one of the booth personnel and say, oh my God, that's so cool. Like, who how did you guys come up with that? They're just standing there. They'll talk to you if they know. They'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, that was our marketing person. Isn't it cool? Yeah, they were just thinking about that the other day. But that's how you learn those things. It's not being sleazy or sneaky. It's like, no, right down below, they're doing all this stuff to get information, but to also to see what you guys like. So how can I take that and scale that so that I don't feel sleazy doing it, but I can manage it, and it's on my terms? And I think that's the biggest thing you can do right here today. Uh, when people come into my Twitch chat sometimes go like, man, I wish I could just play video games and make money for a living. And I go, all you have to do is comedy for free for 10 years in New York City. <laughs> and then you can get paid to be, you know, might have a tiny audience on Twitch. Uh, and that's pretty much like there is kind of a blood sacrifice I've found. Consistency and, uh, you know, just keep putting it out. I mean, we, week in, week out, we did that podcast every single Sunday for years and years and years to no one, to absolute, to the void. Uh, and eventually an audience came out of that. I think it's also don't have tunnel vision. When I went to New York, I was like, we're gonna get a show on HBO, we're gonna be a sketch comedy group, and we're gonna be on HBO, and that was like so stupid. Uh, <laughs> try everything, yeah. you know, because it's like, it's okay if you don't get TikTok, but you gotta try. You gotta try TikTok, and you gotta try Twitch, and you gotta try Instagram, and like, but, but feel free to drop the stuff that's not working. But the stuff that is, like, follow it fiercely and, like, do it a lot for free. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think we only have time for maybe, like, one or two questions, one but one I think two. we're going to have to wrap the, it up. The yeah. other panel, the last panel went over. We can go yeah, over. we could do it. Yeah. All right, so go. we've got time for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, please make it relevant to what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right here in the red glasses. Hi. Uh, I'm Megan. I'm a social Sorry. <laughs> but I, I, since I do social all day, every day, uh, I know the channels I look at for work versus what I do in my personal. So I'm just kind of curious what are your go to when you are doing scrolling? What are the channels that you are uh, on? Um, you mean platforms? Yeah. You do scroll more than me, so I I mean. Reddit. Just the Reddit. <laughs> yeah, Reddit. Yeah, uh, Instagram. That's I'm I'm kind of that's all I'm, that's all. I feel like I'm Blue at. Sky has gotten a little bit. Oh yeah, I, I, I do I do like Blue Sky because yeah. it is not algorithm dr driven. Uh, no, if your your following is like exactly in order of the last person yeah. who posted. It's like 2012 Twitter. Oh yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. So like yeah. Yeah. Follow Reddit. me on Blue Sky. Yeah. It's just my name. <laughs> um. I go to TikTok, but that's mostly because I want to see like all the cute animal videos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, TikTok and Instagram, and usually it's always like 80s commercials that are like throwbacks that yeah. come up nice. with memes and stuff. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to have a row on my phone that was Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, 
and I deleted Facebook. I'm so happy I did, yeah. so that I only look at it like every now and again on my PC just to see what like the crazy high school kid who has like awful like Trump opinions has mm. to say. <laughs> uh, and even still, I'm thinking about getting rid of Twitter because it's. Yeah, I, 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 I find Twitter unusual. Well, I think Elon's yeah. trying to serve me up alt right crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I it's can just tell like, he's messing with my. I mean, it's not even algorithmic. That's the wild yeah. thing about Twitter yeah. is it's pay for play, then it's algorithmic. Yeah. So, so it's like you, the people you see are the people who get who pay to use Twitter. Yeah. So it's like double shitty. Yeah. <laughs> Don't use Twitter. I'm sorry. X. I, I swear it a couple of times before, so it's. Oh, I'm know. sorry. I, 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 there's a warning here saying it that says, there's yeah, there people under 18. Under 18 so out there. sorry. I ruined you. <laughs> I won't pay for your therapy. Uh, next question. Yeah. Um, so offline was, was talked as part of the solution, mm -hmm. but assuming that we still are you know, going online to find audiences, um, to some extent, there are alternatives popping up yeah. for there's Mastodon for Twitter, there's <laughs> Pixel Fed for Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, earlier, Patrick made the point of your audience will follow you, and I was wondering what barriers stand in the way of, of critical mass creators bringing their audiences over to those platforms that are foundationally more democratic than the ones that we're complaining about up here today. What are those barriers to entry? I Convenience. Habit, yeah. yeah. People, I mean, people still use Twitter, which is wild to me. Yeah. It's just like, it, the, it's, it looks like garbage. You don't see what you want to see. The ads are terrible. And yet people still use it because they're just like, well, you know, what else are we going to do? So I, I, I feel like habit is the big barrier. Yeah, yeah and, um, and also I would say that it's, um, a lot of it is just distrust. Uh, for me, it's like, I don't want to join this. This is what Instagram was 10 years ago. In 10 more years, this is gonna be like ruining my life again. So like, I think a lot of it's, you know, my personal like uh, cynicism, but um, I do think that, well, I found uh, a lot of, uh, don't know the word. Um, solace. Nope, not solace, never solace. Uh, I, found, I have found a lot of, <laughs> Dude, hold on. I have found a lot of success in being like, hey, you don't even have to sign up for Twitch. You just gotta watch me draw. Just come. You don't have to say anything. And a little bit like luring people has worked for me. Um, do you have anything to say? Please. Never. Uh, <laughs> actually, I think we're about ready to wrap up. I just wanted to say one thing, which was last year, Hannah and I were sitting at Artist Alley on our tables at the booths. We were just chit chatting. We were like, you know, maybe we should start a show. Maybe we should do a podcast, whatever. We're like, wouldn't it be cool if we started a podcast and then next year we had like a, a panel <laughs> and then that was going to be a thing? And we're like, oh yeah, we're never going to follow through on that and that's never going to happen. That's insane. And lo and behold, here we are in this room with all of you people, yes. with all these fantastic panelists. And also, so we just wanted to say a special shout out to San Diego Comic Con for facilitating that and for all of you here in this room for supporting that dream and dreams can come true. They <laughs> can. Yeah. So thank you guys. Every please round of applause for our panelists. Wait. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's awesome. <laughs> Well, do, do you want to say where we can find you? Sure, yeah. Uh, if you guys want to tell everybody real quick where they can find you, what you're up to, Hannah and I are over in Artist Alley, BBO1 and BBO2. Go. Uh, I'm going to be at the autograph area at 2.30. Um, and, uh, you know, p p you're welcome to show up. Please show up because uh, I, I don't want to be, like, alone. That would be really sad. Uh, and if you, if like, and my books are for sale at the Mysterious Galaxy booth, which is 1119. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I am not exhibiting, <laughs> neither is LA Zine Fest, but LA Zine Fest has their Instagram, um, and that's where you can find any info about any upcoming events, workshops, and any zine-related things. Uh, I'm an artist alley, DD08 on the corner edge, just look for my name and a brown guy running up and down saying hi to everybody. Uh, Holden Nader Show on Twitch, uh, Wizards and the Bruiser podcast, and Page 7 on the Last Podcast Network. And we're also doing a bunch of stuff on LPN TV through the network on Twitch as well. Some exciting stuff coming up. And that's it, San Diego! <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that'd be awesome. Okay. Okay.